Welcome to today's podcast. Um, today we are privileged to have two ladies um, in the e-commerce space. Um, Catherine, VP of Marketing from Copia Global, welcome. Thank you, Fiona. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. Thank you. Grace, um, e-commerce product manager from East African Brewery, Breweries Limited. Welcome. Thank you, Fiona. I'm happy to be here. Excellent. Um, so to begin with, um, tell us a bit about your respective businesses, um, how long you've been around, and the segments that you serve. Catherine. Thanks, Fiona. Uh, so Copia is actually the first um, e-commerce company to be targeting the peri-urban and rural consumer. Uh, Copia was founded in 2013 um, and so as a result of that um, the fact that we target a peri-urban and rural consumer means that even our product segments um, are varied across the different products and the needs that mm. they then have. Mm, excellent. Grace, what about EABL? The bar by EABL is uh, a flagship from the UK, Diageo Market. We are first in East Africa and we're here to deliver to our last uh, uh, mile consumer. This is the person who is ordering from the comfort of their house, at an event, at a back and chill, and we are here to serve the purpose. Amazing, amazing. Now, e-commerce um, in Kenya has been around for at least 10 years, um, each of you launching in different uh, times. Now, what is your take on the adoption of e-commerce in Kenya and Africa, and how have you dealt with the issues of mistrust and digital literacy? which is um, some of the barriers to adoption that we've seen. Grace. Thank you, Fiona. So um, uh, in this market, uh, we are privileged because uh, the ICT sector is very vibrant and uh, us venturing to this e-commerce space, it means the consumer is educated, they are tech savvy. So we have plugged in into a sector where the consumer knows what they want and it's for us to serve that purpose. So in terms of mistrust, uh, at Diageo, at East African Brewery, we are able to uh, work against that because we work with accredited distributors, very reputable and vetted retailers. So it means whatever you're ordering from us gets to you directly from the brewery through our route to market with uh, these distributors and the retailers. Mm, excellent. And what about uh, at Copia? How have you dealt with mistrust and digital literacy? Sure. So um, given the customer segment that we're targeting, um, who are probably not, um, you know, have barriers in terms of um, access to e-commerce. Um, if you look at even smartphone penetration um, at the bottom of the pyramid, it's at circa 50 percent today. Um, the way we've actually gone around the trust barrier, which is, is a critical factor, is our model uh, actually uses agents. Um, and currently we have a footprint of about 50,000 agents. Um, those agents are people in the community. So our customers know them, um, they're neighbors to the same uh, customers. And therefore it becomes, they become a very critical point for the customers to be able to go and understand the credibility of the brand, um, to understand the credibility and the quality of the products that we sell. That we sell. Mm -hmm. And so they become really critical partners in ensuring that we deliver the promise that we, that we make to the customer. Yeah, I see a common thread here in terms of, you know, building that trust using accredited partners. Um, and I think that's a very uh, common thing in the African context, you know, building trust with people who uh, are recognizable in the community. Um, the pandemic um, really accelerated the adoption of e-commerce, um, given that we had to all stay at home. Um, have the gains from that period maintained or have you seen a shift since then, um, Catherine? Sure. So the pandemic um, for Copia and given the Copia model, whereby, again, we're targeting the, you know, bottom of the pyramid customer who's based in the rural areas was a really critical um, pivot uh, t a point for the business. Um, reason being, if you remember during the pandemic, we obviously had uh, travel restrictions. Um, and so people accessing products became a bit of a challenge. Um, given our model and we've been in we've been in existence already and the brand is you know is pretty well known we were listed as one of the essential uh, providers mm -hmm. um, given the product range that we offer which is everyday products mm -hmm. for our customers at a very affordable price mm -hmm. um, what that did was our customers lifestyles were able to continue as they were given those restrictions in travel they were still able to access the products that they needed um, and second to that was also the referrals because uh, the neighbors would see you know a particular customer. Mm -hmm. 
mm. um, still accessing the products, the everyday products. Um, and so what we actually saw during the pandemic was about a times two um, expansion in the business and um, recruitment of customers as well. Um, and because what has happened is because of the convenience of the model and the offering that we give, whereby from the comfort of your home, you can shop and access products, we have seen that continuation um, and growth and expansion of the business and the customers who came on during the pandemic have continued to shop and benefit and access the products that they need from Copia. Mm. What about EABL? Have you um, seen the sustained uh, gains or shifts have happened since then? So echoing what Catherine has said, uh, there has been gains. For us, when it accelerated our entry into the e-commerce space and uh, we launched, and now the channel has become a, a synergized way of getting to our consumers through the many channels that we have in the business. And uh, e-commerce is now one of the robust channels that uh, delivers our holistic strategy as East Africa breweries. So the gains are plenty, and we've been able even to quadruple uh, the revenue we are getting from from this one channel and uh, it's also to deliver the holistic strategy of East African breweries jointly with all the channels. Mm -hmm. Now, I mean, that's really, really impressive. Um, but as we know, there are you know, a lot of barriers to you know, thriving e-commerce um, environment. And um, UNCTAD, uh, the UN Conference for Trade and Development, released a report in 2021 called the e-readiness assessment. Um, this is a report that was commissioned by the Kenya government to assess Kenya's readiness against seven key policy areas. Um, the seven policy areas were e-commerce strategy formulation, ICT infrastructure and services, trade logistics and trade facilitation, payment solutions, the legal and regulatory frameworks, e-commerce skills development, and access to financing. How do you think we're faring on these seven key policy areas and what still needs to be addressed to create a thriving e-commerce environment? Catherine, what's, what's your take? Sure. So the United Nations um, Conference on Trade and Development um, report has been really, really um, insightful and an eye-opener um, in terms of uh, access to information. One of the points that the report actually calls out is that Kenya is the ATA 8th fastest growing e-commerce uh, market globally. In Africa, we're actually ranked fourth. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that it clearly calls out is, you know, in 2020, we were actually the trailblazers in Africa mm -hmm. with 13 new e-commerce businesses actually being established in, in, the, in, the, in the region. Mm -hmm. um, so really, really great insights. Um, it even helped further to talk about what is the revenue that's being generated from those companies, uh, which is actually in the range of 3.6 billion US dollars that expected to mm. be generated um, from those particular 13 companies. So I think um, as, as a continent, we're making great, great headway um, in actually um, in, increasing our e-commerce footprint. Mm -hmm. um, but we still have challenges. Um, one of the challenges, for instance, is around our internet penetration, internet growth. So um, Currently, uh, for instance, in Kenya, the internet penetration is said to be, from a report that Statistica did, is approximately about 44%. Mm -hmm. If you look at that from a global perspective, mm -hmm. uh, penetration of internet is more in the 66%, so about 20 percentage point mm -hmm. difference. So great work being done, but I think we need to accelerate that if yeah. we're really going to um, get the benefits of mm -hmm. e-commerce and what e-commerce does and what it can contribute to our actual GDP. Mm -hmm. um, I think the areas that maybe we, you know, as a government and the respective bodies need to really um, look at and really need to address. Um, one is the whole you know, strategy governance around e-commerce. Um, the report clearly also points out today we do not have an e-commerce strategy that exists as a, as a nation. So mm -hmm. a huge opportunity, I think, for more understanding around e-commerce. What are the benefits to, the, to, the, to the, the citizens of the country? What does it mean and how can it contribute to GDP? Mm -hmm. um, opportunity as well for laws and governance. Um, when, if I think about consumers and this is where a lot of mistrust comes from a consumer perspective if i'm going to use my money which i've worked hard to earn mm -hmm. and shop in e-commerce what are the channels i have for any complaints any issues refunds of mm -hmm. that i need to actually um, process mm -hmm. um, a lot of that is not clearly defined yet mm -hmm. and customers don't have a lot of information around it mm -hmm. so i think it's something that we can all work towards um, us who are players in the e-commerce and partner with government mm -hmm. to really you know um, unlock some of those um, opportunities mm -hmm. absolutely absolutely 
Absolutely. And we'll delve into a few more of those um, aspects as well. Um, actually, you know, thinking about last mile delivery, which is a really key aspect to delivering on the promise of e-commerce. Um, it's a key enabler for driving convenience. Um, does Africa have uh, an advantage, you know, through our border border networks or what we call th uh, our motorcycle networks? Or are we at a disadvantage because of a lack of mapped out addresses? What's your take, Grace? Yes, Africa is uh, at a great advantage. Uh, one, uh, for us as a business, uh, it has helped us to cut costs because we plugged in through third party, uh, very good third party partners. So we are able to use an already existing company whose core business is last mile to deliver to our consumers. Mm -hmm. And also with this synergy, we are able to get, uh, to grow our business faster with uh, also um, uh, low cost uh, and also having a uh, people who are in that business, who, whose their core business is in delivery to deliver to our consumers. And uh, with that, we've been able to have the widest coverage in Kenya. Mm, excellent. Excellent. What about for your business at Copia? Fiona, for us, it's an everyday reality mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, because we are targeting customers who are in the upcountry rural areas. Mm -hmm. um, so we come off tarmac roads, we come off graded roads, yeah. you know, we're going on, you know, um, off-grid, off, off off-grid yeah. roads. Yeah. Um, and so delivering to customers who don't have addresses mm -hmm. um, is, and, and obviously how do we then leverage um, the, the, the motorcycle associations? Because if you think about it also, it's a really great avenue in terms of employment. Mm -hmm. um, and so what we've actually done is work a lot, and especially during the weather when it's raining, where access becomes a challenge, you actually find the community even comes together and actually gets even those motorcycle um, uh, circles and members to work together with us mm -hmm. so that they can come and reach the vehicle where it's stuck, you know, mm -hmm. in terms of the off-grid road mm -hmm. um, and actually then still access their products. Mm -hmm. So for us, it's been a huge opportunity and, and obviously then um, ensuring that it's also an employment avenue mm -hmm. um, for, for people to start their, their businesses mm -hmm. using a motorcycle. Mm -hmm. Nice. I love that. I love that. I love where, how we're leveraging, you know, even though we may not have the typical, you know, e-commerce environment, we've leveraged on what is unique to our continent, which is the um, motorcycle network. Now, given e-commerce is driven heavily by technology and data, um, what sort of data are you using to improve customer experiences? Um, and what will be the role of, you know, first party, second party and third party data in delivering enhanced consumer experiences? Uh, for us, uh, the Baba EABL, uh, we have uh, quick access to first party data. We also have, because of the partnership, we have second party data and third party data. So with this uh, data, we've been able now to understand our consumers' personas, to craft campaigns that are within what we have discovered through insights and also to have personalized experience of our consumers. So for us, we are making this transactional data our everyday currency to actualize our vision and mission. Mm -hmm. What about for you at Copia? Yeah, so just to echo uh, Grace's sentiments, um, the data, data today, you, you cannot run a successful, relevant business without data mm -hmm. and without understanding what the customer is saying. It doesn't matter how fantastic your product is, um, you need the data first to understand what is the opportunity. Um, that exists in the market. So at Copia, we leverage um, first party data, um, mm -hmm. a lot of data that we have because of the fact that it's e-commerce, so you're able to access exactly what customers are buying, mm -hmm. understand their be purchase behaviors, understand the motivation behind those um, patterns as well. Um, the other important way as well is the two-way data. So it's not just us using the data, but also the customer giving them a portal where they can share feedback, they can share mm -hmm. information mm -hmm. um, with Copia, and we're then able to ensure that we quickly turn that data into um, action yeah. and ensure that we've then got either products that they're asking us for, um, if there's any issues on the prices that we've set for products, they're able to then also give us that information. Mm -hmm. um, Maybe I'd like to take that question a bit further. You know, what are some of the trends that you've seen um, with this data um, that are informing your business strategies and so on? Yes, uh, some of the trends we've seen is uh, 
the consumers changing their brand loyalty. Uh, we've seen uh, the change in the economic uh, status and most people now are spending less. So what we are doing uh, in our execution strategies, like uh, it's only um, uh, uh, by the bar that offers you free delivery. So it means instead of you spending more, on top of giving you um, the recommended retail price for the product that you used to buy, we are going uh, ahead and also uh, ensuring that the drink is getting to you free of charge so these insights are coming with the choices you see someone uh, now who was aspiring to buy this drink has now uh, went and uh, started purchasing another product that is of a different level so we are telling the consumer your brand is still affordable your brand gets to you free of charge and from inside, this is where we are able to see the shift. When you change from ordering, for example, Johnny Walker Green, and now you are going to another brand of whiskey, mm -hmm. we are able to know and also craft a campaign to show you. Uh, you can still access your product at a very good price, RRP, and it will get to you free of charge. Mm -hmm. So thanks to data, we are able to see that and also uh, craft a way to turn it around. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that. You're starting to, you know, uh, touch on the personalization side yes. of things, yeah. um, which we'll definitely delve into. Um, on your side, on Copia, you know, maybe an example of how you're using the data to drive better experience for your product, for your uh, customers. Sure. Um, two things I can touch on. Um, the first one is actually also data, and here it's more your you know, third, second party, third party data, actually um, informing your geographical footprint and your geographical coverage, and where are the opportunity markets. Mm -hmm. So very critical, uh, because then you're, and also understand you know what are the what are they buying in that area what's important to those mm -hmm. customers so that even as you enter that market um, then you're being very relevant mm -hmm. with, with with your presence in that market and you're answering to that customer need um, the second way that for us it's really helped us uh, from a customer experience perspective um, and because we use agents is we've enabled agents to be able to give us uh, live information um, on product prices because again we can't be in 50,000 places at the same time mm -hmm. um, and to actually then even understand regional pricing differences that are existing in different markets yeah. um, and that has really then enabled us to be able to have the right regional level of pricing right regional level of product um, relevance product offering mm -hmm. to, to people in different markets um, which has been really really <laughs> transformational for us mm, I love that I love that I think Data has really enabled um, brands to serve the consumer um, with, uh, with what they need at the time that they want. Um, it's a really exciting time um, you know, to be alive. And you know, just to flow on that same point, um, you know, digital commerce is giving consumers more choice, increased convenience, and improved shopping experiences, as you've just mentioned. Um, the growth in online shopping is now driven by responsible use of data. Again, we've talked about a lot of data being generated. Um, which builds loyalty and retains shoppers. So how are you um, balancing between personalization and privacy for your consumers? Grace. All right, so uh, data privacy and data security, uh, it's, um, it informs what the consumer is expecting when they come to your web website. For us um, at EABL1, we adhere to the Diageo Code of Ethic. So whatever data we are asking the consumer to share, one, there is consent, two, we ensure that it's very minimal. So any solution or any application that we are rolling out to the public, it has to go through privacy impact assessment. Mm -hmm. We assess, is it um, infringing into your rights? Mm -hmm. And we also are adhering to the Data Protection Act. So the Agile Code of Ethics ensures that whatever information we get from our consumers is very minimal and it's only necessary to ensure that uh, we are able to cater to your experience and uh, give you an application that uh, takes you through uh, ordering our brands and also just serving the purpose of ordering through our e-commerce uh, platform only. Mm. Amazing, amazing. Mm. What about Acopia? How are you balancing personalization and privacy? Yeah, I think just to add on to what Grace has already covered, it's um, also about how you keep the customer data that you have. Who has access to that data? Um, how you, um, you know, uh, warehousing 
um, that data, which is also very, very critical. Mm -hmm. um, and then also just holding the bare minimum that mm -hmm. is required. I think that's also critical. Um, and actually, I do encourage Kenyans to really be aware um, of their of their of their rights when mm -hmm. it comes to data and data protection, mm -hmm. uh, because I think we're going to see a huge shift in it. Um, and so the other thing that we've also been doing is being very proactive, just to ensure that we are working with the Kenya Data Protection um, body that has been formed. Mm -hmm. um, because it's a journey. It's a journey that's, I think, new to many of us. Um, and so it's really around how do you partner with them so that they understand what data you're holding and they're giving you the day-to-day -day advice so that you, we can be compliant. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I guess this also just ties back, you know, to that whole trust factor. Yes. You know, this is another level of building trust yeah. with um, your consumers. Absolutely, yeah. Okay. Given e-commerce is driven heavily by technology and data, what sort of data are you using to improve the customer experience? What is the role of first-party data, data which you gather straight from your consumers, or second-party data, which is data you gather from partners who you uh, partner with to do events, or third-party data, which is anonymized data like cookie data and so on. Um, how do you use these different types of data to enhance consumer experiences? Grace. Uh, for us, uh, we use uh, both, uh, we use actually the three, the first party, second party and third party data. When uh, the first party data, we're able to know uh, if you move from your location, we're able to tell what time you order from the bar, we're able to know the peak times for all our consumers. We are also able to craft a campaign based on seasons. You could see uh, during uh, weekends, people order, especially during Edmonds, you'll be able to tell they order high value products because also they, it means they have money in their pocket. Mid month, we're able to craft a campaign to cater to you based on your spend within that time of the month. So for us, we leverage every campaign we use um, uh, the data to, to drive uh, the experience towards this uh, consumer. So for us, the first party data, second party data, the third party data, we leverage on it and we are able to even capitalize on these insights that we get to tailor your experience uh, through the bar. What about for you at Copia? Sure, and, and I think it's important also to say that um, letting the customer opt in to actually having their data being used is mm -hmm, critical mm -hmm. um, in step. the age, the, in the first step in the age that we you know where we are today, yeah. um, in terms of consumer protectionism. Mm -hmm. um, at Copia as well, we we certainly um, leverage on first party data, the data that we collect, uh, that's normally that comes through from transactions. So, uh, just as an example, a customer who buys a bag of flour, uh, we are able to see how many pieces of flour are they buying, when are they actually making that purchase, how much are they spending when they make that purchase, and we're able to then and see if that's what they did last month and the following month, what has actually, you know, does that uh, same pattern continue or does it change? Mm -hmm. um, and the reason that's important is because uh, some of the information that we've been able to pick up from uh, first party data, um, when we've either seen a change in their purchase behavior has actually helped us identify an insight that is linked to regional pricing and also product preference. Mm -hmm. So I'll give you an example. Um, we actually know today, because of that type of data, there's a bar soap called Kibuyu bar soap that is very popular in the western part of the country. Mm -hmm. um, whereas if we were to offer our customers in central Kenya Kibuyu, they've got no idea what that product is because mm -hmm. It's not a product that's sold in that part of the country. Mm -hmm. So we're very clear in that part of the country, it is Jama bar soap, it is classic bar soap. And it, we're also able to then price it mm -hmm. at a price point that is relevant um, to, the, to the consumer. Mm -hmm.